Hello there, my fellow mythologians, and the uh, 50 or so people who actually watch this series, and welcome. I know I said that the last video on Artemis was gonna be the second chance for the series, on gods and goddesses anyway, but now I kinda realize I'm probably not gonna get a lot of views on these things anyway. So I'm gonna take a bit of advice I was given on the previous episode, and talk about things which are less famous or readily available in other sources. Of course, these are things that I myself enjoyed. Fun fact about me here, I never recommend things that I didn't check out first myself. So, for today we're gonna talk about Cronus, the father of many of the Olympian gods. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The etymology of the word Cronus is rather obscure. Despite some conflation of the terms in multiple time periods, Cronus is not necessarily derived from the Greek word Kronos, which means time. Nor is the Kronos we're gonna talk about today related to Kronos, which is the personification of time in Greek mythology. Although Cronus was the god of time among the Titans, Kronos is an entirely different entity. The word and the name may be related to the Proto-Indo-European root Krino, which would later develop into the Latin word Kornu and the Germanic Hurnas, from which the actual English word horn was derived. This reference to a so-called horned deity may suggest a possible connection with the ancient Indian demon Kroni or the Levantine deity El. The legend of Cronus may have also been extrapolated from events in the life of an actual historical figure. An account ascribed by the historian Eusebius to the semi-legendary pre-Trojan War Phoenician historian Sanchuniathon, I'm sorry if I butchered it, indicates that Cronus may have originally been a Canaanite ruler who founded the city of Byblos and then was subsequently deified. This report gives us an alternate name as Elus or Elus, and states that in the 32nd year of his reign, he castrated, slew, and deified his own father, Epigeus. And you're gonna learn about a parallel to this in a few minutes. This Epigeus, or so the narrative claims, was thereafter known as Uranus. It further says that after ships were invented, Cronus, when visiting the so-called inhabitable world, bequeathed Attica to his own daughter, Athena, and then Egypt to Toph, the son of Mysore. So, with the schematics of the word out of the way, let us get on with the legend proper. Once upon a time, Cronus was the youngest of twelve titans, which were the divine descendants of the earth goddess Gaia and the sky god Uranus he eventually married his sister Rhea, another earth goddess. As he was coupled with Rhea, Cronus sired Poseidon, Hades, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, and Zeus. Other children Cronus is supposed to have had include the centaur Chiron with the nymph Philera, and the personification of strife, the goddess Eris, by the night goddess Nyx. As a result of the association with the so-called Golden Age, Cronus was construed as a harvest deity, overseeing agriculture, grain, and nature in general. Thus, the fact that his consort was supposed to be Rhea, the Earth Mother, is not surprising whatsoever. While she was responsible for allowing the crops to grow, it was Cronus who performed the harvest. As such, he was usually depicted wielding a sickle, which he used not only to harvest crops, but also as a weapon to castrate his own father, Uranus. Cronus was also connected to the progression of time as it is related to humanity. Cronus hated Uranus with a passion, envious of the power his father enjoyed as ruler of the known universe. Uranus's feelings for Cronus were pretty much reciprocal, as he hated all the children that Gaia had given him. One day, Uranus had had enough, and hid their other children, the hundred-armed Hecaton Kyries and the one-eyed Cyclopes, in the underworld of Tartarus, so they would not be able to ever see the light of day. This made Gaia very angry, and prompted her to create a massive iron sickle, 
so that she and her other children, the Titans, could orchestrate their revenge. She would gather together Cronus and his brothers and try to persuade them to kill Uranus with the sickle. But all of them were justifiably afraid of Uranus's power, outside of Cronus, who was more than willing to undertake the mission. Gaia placed the sickle in the hands of Cronus and positioned him for an ambush. When Uranus met with Gaia that night, Cronus ambushed him and cut off his testicles, and then cast them off into the sea. From the drops of blood, or by other counts, semen, which fell from Uranus's wound and onto the earth, the so-called Gigantes, Erinis, and Melie were born. Aphrodite, in one of her own origin stories, came out of the vital fluids which fell into the sea, drifting onto the shore on the severed member. As a result of these acts, an angry Uranus threatened vengeance, and labeled his sons as the Titans, which also means the Straining Ones. Shortly after dealing with Uranus, Cronus re-imprisoned the Hecaton Kyries, the Gigantes and the Cyclopes, and commanded a dragon known as Campe to guard them. He and Rhea assumed the title of King and Queen of the Universe and the period that followed where Cronus ruled was known as the Golden Age, because all of humanity restrained from immorality and performed only good deeds. But although Cronus was now dominant over the other gods, he was plagued by the burden of the assault he had perpetrated against his father. His worries were only exacerbated by the prophecy delivered by his parents that he too was destined to become overcome by his own son. As a result, Cronus promptly swallowed each of the four children Rhea bore him, as soon as they were born, in the hope of preventing the prophecy from being realized. When the fifth and sixth children, Poseidon and Zeus, were born, Rhea sought Gaia so they can devise a plan to save the newborns, and also to gain retribution for Cronus's acts against his father. Rhea covertly gave birth to Zeus in Crete, hiding him in a cave on the northern slope of Mount Ida. Instead of the actual child, she gave Cronus a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes, which he swallowed greedily, thinking that it was his son. Rhea then used a similar ruse to save Poseidon, this time tricking Cronus to swallow a goat instead of the actual child. Rhea kept Zeus hidden on Mount Ida. According to some versions of the story, he was raised by a goat named Amalthea while a company of dancers called the Kurites shouted and clapped their hands to render the baby's cries inaudible. Another version of the myth claims that Zeus was raised by the nymph Adamanthea, who hid Zeus by dangling him by a rope from a tree so that he was suspended beneath the earth, the sea, and the sky. Once he had grown up, Zeus used the potion given to him by Gaia to force Cronus to vomit and up came the contents of his stomach in reverse order. First the stone, which was set down at Pytho under the glens of Mount Parnassus, then the goat, and then Zeus's two brothers and three sisters. In a more brutal version of the story, the stomach of Cronus is cut open by Zeus. After he freed his brothers and sisters, Zeus released the Gigantes, the Hecaton Kyries, and the Cyclopes from Tartarus. This would incite an epic war called the Titanomachy, where Zeus and his siblings, with the help of the Gigantes, Hecaton Kyries, and Cyclopes, overthrew Cronus and the other Titans. Afterwards, many of them were confined in Tartarus instead, although not all of them. Cronus was among those who escaped imprisonment, instead running away into relative obscurity. Considering his fallen mythological status, it is not surprising that Cronus was not so celebrated in ancient Greece. However, he was not entirely forgotten either. In Athens, on the twelfth day of the Athenian month, or Hecatombion, a festival called the Cronia was held in honor of Cronus. The nature of the festival was agrarian, as it occurred after the final grain harvest. Therefore, Cronus was seen as a main god of agriculture and closely connected to the event. During the Cronia, social mores were temporarily disabled. For example, the slaves were emancipated from their duty and permitted to participate at the festivities alongside their masters. In some cases, the masters actually turned into the servants, 
serving them food during the feast. This was done to commemorate the Golden Age under Cronus, when slavery and oppression were not a thing. Furthermore, in its acknowledgement of the tenuous nature of Dominion, the festival paid homage to the myth in which Cronus overthrew his father, only to be overthrown himself by Zeus. While the Greeks did believe that Cronus was a representative of chaos and disorder, having fronted the crude and malicious titans, the Romans' view on the character was a bit more positive. Although the Romans did draw heavily upon Cronus when they developed their own character, Saturn, they favored Saturn a lot more than Greeks did Cronus. Under Roman influence, Saturn's character became a lot more innocuous. His association with the Golden Age led him to become viewed as the god of, air tags, human time, including the calendar, the seasons, and the harvest. Furthermore, while the Greeks largely neglected Cronus, considering him to be nothing more than an intermediary between Uranus and Zeus, Saturn became an indispensable figure in Roman mythology. For example, the popular public festival Saturnalia was dedicated in his honor, celebrating the dedication of Saturn's temple. Just like in the Cronia celebration, the social order was temporarily disabled during the event and the roles of slaves and freemen were often reversed. As a result of Cronus's importance to the Romans as Saturn, he has also indirectly become a large influence on Western culture. In accordance with the Near Eastern tradition, the seventh day of the Judeo-Christian week was also called in Latin Dies Saturni, or the day of Saturn, which in turn was adapted and became the source of the English word Saturday. In astronomy, the planet Saturn is so-called because of Roman influence. It was considered the seventh and outermost of the seven heavenly objects that are visible with the naked eye, thereby corresponding to the seventh day of the week. Moreover, some have entertained the theory that Saturnalia may have actually influenced the celebration of Christmas, as both occur in late December and involve an exchange of gifts as well as the acknowledgement of an evergreen tree. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about Cronus, not to be confused with Kronos, for today. There's actually a good deal more to be learned about this guy if we were to look more in depth at the Roman perspective on him or Saturn. In fact, I could probably make another whole video just on that. But you folks can let me know. Is Cronus among your favorite mythological figures? What are your thoughts on the myths surrounding this guy? Or do you think he was a paranoid asshole for eating his children? As always, do let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Thanks a lot for watching and have a healthy day. This is GDN signing out.